financial planner, I've been very fortunate over the last 25 years to work with a lot of very influential individuals, uh, business owners, and then different families. Very successful entrepreneurs have a very high purpose. They attach a very high passion to it, and they're very defined in what they want their impact to be. Now, when you talk about purpose, we can talk about it from two different perspectives. We can talk about it from the world's perspective, how does the world define purpose? And then we can talk about it from God's perspective. How does God define purpose? But what I, what I really realized is that most of these individuals that are highly driven, uh, that they have certain what I call triggers that are really driving them to that real high level of purpose. Now what do we mean by a trigger? Well normally what I've found, triggers are normally fears. In other words, there is something in their childhood, something in their life experiences is driving them to this high level of purpose. Now here's the problem, I want to make sure I get this across. That if you have very high purpose in your life and you attach a high level of passion to that, if it is the wrong purpose, guys, you're going to get to the wrong destination faster. Now let me take you to, to my personal situation. When I was 13, I actually came down with spinal meningitis. I was raised in a little town called Gainesville, Texas, right north of here. Never forget it, 1973. I was in PE that day, and, and I had about 102 degree temperature. Coach actually said, Hatcher, you look ash and white, go the nurse. I go the nurse, 102 degree temperature. Nurse says, Guy, we'll call your mom. Now, believe it or not, it's kind of funny. They go ahead and send me up to English class and, you know, with 102 degree temperature. And so I remember walking into English class, walking into a room very similar to this. You know, teacher's desk is right here. Second chair back, three rows over. I can still see this room. Got the little bitty and the little stud in eighth grade sitting right next to me. Bell hadn't rung yet. Intercom's right above me, one of those old intercoms. And uh, someone comes over the intercom and says, Guy, your mom is here. Come on down. I get up. Now, I'm a lanky. I go from 5'2 to 5'10 my eighth grade year. So as I'm walking out the door, the two little special people start making fun of me. They start belittling who I am. They start belittling what I have on. Guys, to this day, I can remember exactly what I said as I went across that threshold. I said, someday you will not make fun of me. Just like that, that seed got planted. That trigger got set. And for my whole life, I've been driven on making money. I've been driven on what I wear. I've been driven on where I live. I've been driven on what my wife wears. My whole life I've dealt with that issue. The problem with triggers are if they're fear-based, which most of them are, most of them are going to be fear-based, what it's basically doing, it's making me run away from something versus run to something. And I'm going to tell you, most successful individuals are running from something versus running to something. So I don't think impact is a choice, guys. You know, and, and the problem is this, we're going to have impact whether we really want to or not. It just might be negative impact. So my theory is, let's have positive impact. But if you look at Abraham and Lot, Abraham had phenomenal impact in his life. Continues to have phenomenal impact. How come? Because God gave him the covenant. God blessed Abraham and said, you and your offspring will be great. You will have phenomenal land. You will be blessed phenomenally for the rest of your life. It will pass from generation to generation to generation. But let's go back and talk about Lot for a second, because this really intrigues me. If, when you go in and read about Lot, he goes into Sodom and Gomorrah. Go up to about chapter 17. Three visitors show up on Abraham's, you know, at his place. Ends up one of them being God. He, they're going for a walk. He says, how can I hide this from my faithful servant? I'm going to go in and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because it's become wicked. And remember, Lot's parked his little bottom in Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay? But here's what intrigues me about it. You know, Abraham begs, hey, if there's one faithful person, or actually 50, 40, 10, gets all the way down to 10, and God says, if there's 10, I won't destroy it. So, goes in, lots get, got, Lot gets warned. Guess how many people come out of Sodom and Gomorrah? Four. 
Lot, his wife, his two daughters. Now think this through. He had herdsmen just like Abraham did. I mean, this, Abraham had 318 trained soldiers. He had thousands of you know, people that worked for him and traveled with him and lived with him. Abraham had tremendous impact. Lot had the same thing. Guys, Lot had no impact. He goes into Sodom and Gomorrah, and you would think he's got all these guys saying, I'm going to follow you wherever. He's hightailing it out because, you know, he's trying to follow what God's saying. He's got no one that's followed him. That finally hit me. Lot had no impact in his life. So here's our choice. Do we want to have impact in our life like Abraham? Or do we want to have impact in our life like Lot? That's what I'm finally starting to realize. So the reason I tell you this is God has called us all directly to have impact in our life.